church. Well, you guys look beautiful this morning. You smell amazing. Yeah, I can smell you from all the way up here. Anyway, I don't know about you, but I woke up this morning thinking about how great God is and how he fights my battles. So I'm so excited to worship with you today. So will you rise as we worship our King? When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see the mountain. Come on. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. Worship in this next song, declaring God's never-changing ways. He's always the same today, tomorrow, and always. I believe you gave sight to the blind. 
been faithful and he fights for battles. Can you give him a shout of praise this morning as loud as you can? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hey, as we transition into this song, um, I just want to share a little bit of the backstory before we, we do. Um, we've been reading through Matthew chapter 5, a little bit of the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been reflecting through it as a team. We've been praying through it, and this next song is purely that scripture. So we wonder, what's the best way for us to introduce this song? What's the best way for us to transition into this? So we said, why not take the practice of reading scripture, uh, scripture together as, as, a, as a church, as a community, right? Back, just put it back into our church, right? So we're like, let's do that. Let's do that today. So we're going to do that. We're just going to put uh, your attention onto the screen this morning as we read this out together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, 
for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Our hope is that whatever line from that scripture stands out to you today, that you will reflect on that as we sing this song. Just see what God is trying to speak through this, through the scripture, through the song. Just reflect on it. Just open your heart.
be filled. That's why we're all here, to just lift you up, to exalt you, to make more of you. And God, I know a lot of us have a lot going on in life. But Holy Spirit, I pray that supernaturally over the next few minutes, you would just kind of pause, block all that out. And that this physical space in Holland, Michigan, would become an embassy of heaven even more so in the next few minutes. That tears would be wiped away, that joy would be restored, that people would be encouraged. God, we just got done singing and Holy Spirit, you were convicting me like that you fill us, you fill us. God, I pray over anyone under the sound of my voice that is desiring affirmation or validation or promotion or credit or struggling with insecurity and they're just needing, they're wanting something from somebody else. God, I pray that today that they would be filled with you, with your peace, with your joy, with your love, with your strength, God. And we thank you that you want us this morning, God, that you're here with us and we just pray for more of that. So Jesus, thank you for what you're already doing in this space, and we can't wait to see what else you're going to do. I pray that everyone, from the tech booth to the people switching the video in the back to the musicians and everyone sitting, that we would all look more like you as a result of being here today. So thank you for how you're moving. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Hey, before you sit down, look at one person and tell them you are the most incredible person I've seen in the last two minutes. Tell them. Wow. Tell them. Travis, you're the most incredible person I've you seen are. in the last two minutes. You are the most incredible. Woo! All right, sit down. We ain't got that much time. No. 
Hey, welcome to everybody online. Welcome everybody here. My name's Corey, one of the guys that gets to serve and lead. And I want to introduce to you somebody that y'all know way better than me, one of my best friends in the world, one of our most valuable MVP, most valuable pastors in the Water's Edge Network. He's gracious, he's kind, he's hospitable. I just want to keep gassing you up. This is fun. This is Pastor Travis. Will y'all help me and welcome me, Pastor Travis? Corey, thank you. Hey, you know, I realized first hour how much... How much there's a... How much shorter I am. Yeah. You can say it. I'm just, I'm not, because I know it just, it will snowball and we'll get ourselves I in trouble. I pray that the Lord will fill you with kindness this morning. I need Travis. it. I need it. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Hey, whether you're here in person or you're watching online this morning, we are so thrilled you made the decision to be here. And so we just want to take a few moments and give you all a shout out. Thanks for being here. It is special that we get to come together and worship Jesus in this place. Hey, if you're brand new to Central, welcome to our church. Yep. So glad that you made the decision to be here with us. We're so glad that, that you're here, whether your kids are in kids ministry, your students are in student ministry, wherever your family might be across this campus. If you're here sitting this morning at Central and you're brand new or newer, we're so happy you're here. There's a few really great ways for you to get connected here. You can send us a text by texting Central Hall into 94,000. It's a really simple way for you to get some more information, to get more connected, to see what's happening around here. You can even scan the QR code that's located on the, pew, on, the, on the pews right in front of us or on the screen right over here. And so it's an opportunity for you to see what's happening here at Central Wesleyan Church. And so if you wanna learn a little bit more of what It up, works! Of course it works. I've it, never done the Pew one. We're going to talk about this later, Pastor Corey. We're going to talk about this later. I it's like okay. surprising Travis when I'm up here. Y'all should try that camera. It, it's, it's like everything that we're doing. It's like a whole it was school a church bulletin. And they are right now. I can see it even upstairs. They're, they're, they're <laughs> scanning the QR. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're here and you actually want to meet a person, we have an amazing guest services team right in the lobby at Central Connect. Nathan and Amy Smith lead guest services. And so if you're new, we want to give you a gift. We want to welcome you. We want to give you a high five and help you get better connected. This is a special church that really wants you to feel like it's not just special church for us, but special church for you as, as, you as well. Amen. We're having some fun this morning. Travis, that's a good point. But hey, I, I want to tell you guys about an upcoming series. But before that, we have one more event coming up before we launch a new series. And Travis, I know this is a, an event near and dear to your heart. Yes. You're very invested in our life development, our kids' ministries, and student yeah. ministries. What do we have going on this week? Yeah, so this Saturday, parents in the room, if you're a parent in the room, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yeah, so this weekend, we have our winter party, which is an amazing community event that over half the people who come to it don't even go to our church yet. And so it is a community opportunity for us to have a lot of fun for us to invite our friends. This entire lobby at Saturday at 3 p.m. is going to be filled with inflatables, and it is a great way for you to be able to connect with some of your friends, with some of your friends' kids, but also be able to connect with new people that don't come to our church quite yet. It's going to be special. Is there an age limit on the inflatables? You can totally come. I was totally setting you up to say no, but there's a height limit, but you didn't do it. I did it. I was um, about to go there, but I did it. I did it. I put it on a tee for you. But anyways, so yeah, that's coming up. A lot of fun things coming up. Travis, we're wrapping up this series, not this weekend, but next weekend. Again, the righteous rhythms, the routines that set us up for a successful 2023. Been a fun one. We're going to hear from Pastor Craig in a second. But in two weeks, everybody say two weeks. Two weeks. Dos semanas. Yeah, I think that means two weeks in Spanish. But in two weeks, um, we are launching a series called Guardians. And, and here's where this comes from. One of our values at Central is God's Word, is Scripture. As you just saw, we just sang a bunch of God's Word. Anybody love God's Word? You're glad that we value that highly. And so sometimes we do topical series like this rhythm one, but in Guardians Volume 1 and 2, we are going to go chapter by chapter through First and Second Timothy. And as an added bonus, I don't know if you know this about your lead pastor, Pastor Craig, but for like a hobby, like for fun, Travis, he writes commentaries on the Bible. Anybody else like that? No, we're all normal. No, <laughs> but Greg, we're so grateful for you. I love how much you love God's word. And in the planning for this, he was like, well, I've actually written a companion guide for all of First and Second Timothy. So not only are we gonna be studying in it from the platform, we're gonna provide a companion guide digitally for you guys to go even more in depth. And then if you want to kick it off with us, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, we're going to be doing, how do, what do we call it? A living word reading with Pastor Mike, and we're gonna read through to where you can just listen to First and Second Timothy to get us ready. So we're gonna be digging into that. It's gonna be a great series. 
get ready, maybe even go ahead and, you know, read through First and Second Timothy, see what God does in you getting ready for that series. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. Next weekend, we have our hymn sing at yeah. 6 o'clock, and we have Dwight Beal. Anybody know Dwight Beal in here? Yeah. And Roger Bird. Any Roger Ooh, Bird? Yeah. Old school, yeah. This is a little bit even before our time. And so we've got some friends that are coming back that will be with us next weekend. You won't want to miss it. It's a special time of being able to connect and hang out together as a family and sing some great hymns. Yeah. Now, Travis, I'm going to let you do I did it the first service, but... Yeah. One of my favorite things about you is you're just a consistent dude. Consistent in every way. You, you show up, you're a friend, you're kind, you're generous, and, and your giving and your heart of generosity has been a ministry to me and watching it. And so I'm going to let you do this one this time. I like it. I keep you on your toes. That's great. Yeah. And while we're complimenting, I'd say next, next time you get on YouTube, if you weren't a part of Pastor Corey's message last Sunday, go back and listen to it. It's one of the best messages I've heard you preach in 12 years. So, anywho... What does that say about my other messages? No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Give me. Go. Go. Yeah, we're not going to go there. We're running out of so, time. If you're here this morning and you are a part of Central and you give, we do want to take a moment and just pause and just say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for giving. You know, this morning I was driving into church and the sun was coming up for the first time in a long while that I've actually seen the sun, I'm just going to say. And driving in this morning, seeing the sun come up, it reminded me of the scripture from the book of Lamentations where it talks about God's goodness, his mercy, his faithfulness are new every single morning. And sometimes we don't give because we don't think that. We don't believe that. And so I just want to encourage you today that God's faithful. He loves you so much. And maybe this is the year, 2023, that you start giving and tithing. If you're brand new here, we don't want anything from you. We just want you to enjoy this service. We want you to be a part of this house. We want you to find friends and family. But if you are a part of this church, there's different great ways to give. Online, giving kiosks, even by mail or the QR code, that works as well. But we just want to say thank you for being so generous and for being a part of this church, not just sacrificially giving, but seeing that when you give, it's not going to a church, it's going to the kingdom. So thank you for giving. Hey, it's time for us to welcome up Pastor Craig. We've been yeah. up here, we've been up here way too long. Our rhythm series. Way we'll too wrap long. it up. I do want to say happy MLK weekend, everybody. And we have an incredible Sunday planned for you today from a very own lead pastor bringing the word. Y'all give a hand give to Pastor up. Craig as he comes up for Rhythm Part 3. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Central for week three of our series, Rhythm. And today I want to talk about resistance. Week number one, Pastor Mike talked about routines. Last week, Corey talked about rest. Today I want to talk about resistance. Let me begin by saying this. My body resists heights. My body resists heights. Now, that dislike of heights manifests itself as fear, but I wouldn't say that I'm afraid. My heart beats when I see a drop. My breaths shorten, and I start instinctively to panic. My body does not like heights, but I wouldn't say I'm afraid of them. Five years ago, Vipka and I decided to take a 25th anniversary trip to Switzerland, went to the part of Switzerland where we went on honeymoon, and uh, there's one part there that we truly love, and it's in the Swiss Alps, and um, you can take a cable car up, and when you're up on the top of that thing, you can do lots of different activities, you can walk, and, and they've got this bridge that's made of glass underneath. There's a reason Vipka's on the end and I'm taking the photo. Because <laughs> when I walk on that bridge, my body does what it does. My heart beats, my breath shortens, and my mind starts to play tricks on me. Now, in this moment, I've learned that 
If I truly want to experience the beauty of God's creation, and I love the mountains. Any of you love the mountains? I just love the water and the mountains. And when I'm at the, the mountains and uh, the water, I basically experience the, 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 the majesty of God through nature that I don't get anywhere else. And so I, I just love just looking down on all the creation. But the problem is my body doesn't like heights. And so in this moment, the way I describe it is, the way I work through this is the way I used to parent my toddlers. Any of you got toddlers out there? Right? You, they get to that phase where the world is just wonderful, right? And if you're parenting your toddler, you've got this indescribable bond to your child in that age because you know if you don't stick and they don't stick to you, they're gone. And so what kind of happens is you see a toddler and sometimes you'll just follow their eyes and, and you just know what they're going to do. And you're looking at them going, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't think that. It's kind of like that for me in heights. Okay? I, I look, at the, look at the height and then all of a sudden my heart beats, my breath shortens, and my brain starts to go, ooh. And I start to talked to my body like I talked to my toddler. I'm like, Craig, you do realize this is Swiss construction, right? <laughs> the Swiss know how to build things. This is not going to go down. This is totally safe. Breathe, boy. Breathe. I talk to myself that way, and when I talk to myself that way, I can basically walk out. I make sure they look straight, not down, but I can, I can walk out that way. My body doesn't like heights, but I wouldn't say that I'm afraid. I've just recognized that my body has a natural resistance to heights, that if I want to experience the beauty of creation, I have to resist what my body resists. When it comes to heights then, I have to tell my body no. No. Steve Jobs once said, innovation is saying no to 1,000 things. Every creative knows that true creativity ultimately operates in the context of constraints. The, the Bible doesn't put it like Jobs does, but one of my favorite scriptures, one of my life scriptures, Proverbs 29, 18, says this, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who keeps the law. All too often we quote the first part of the verse, not the second part of the verse, but in Proverbs, the both of them go together. This is put in the negative. When you don't have a revelation, a revelation from God, you run around completely and utterly free. But when you have received that revelation from God, what you do is you restrain yourself. To be driven by a vision of God for your life requires you to exercise restraint. In the first week of the series, Pastor Mike shared our heart for us all for 2023. It's that we would have this, an experience this year of God in a way that would be so fresh. That we would deepen our encounter with God through his word and in prayer. Last week, Pastor Corey talked to us about the rhythm of rest. It's rather ironic to me that our vocation as Christ followers requires rest, but our career requires us to race. The word vocation comes from the Latin word that means calling. The word career comes from the French word that means racetrack. <laughs> so basically, we have a choice if we want to exercise rest which God says is a key part of experiencing the vitality of our relationship with him. We have a choice. We will either pursue our career and race around and continue to do all the things that we've tried to do before, or we will restrain ourselves in order to fulfill our 
vocational calling which requires rest. Your career requires you to race. Your vocation requires you to rest. The only way that you can rest is to restrain the urge to race. If we're truly going to deepen our walk with Christ this year, if we're truly going to experience rest, then we have to resist what comes natural to us. I wonder how many of you, having heard last week's message, went around thinking, you know what, I'm looking at my calendar. I've got no time in death to practice any kind of Sabbath at all. I really need to rest. Now, how many of you would ultimately say that you are afraid of rest? Probably no one. But the reality is the rhythms that you put your body through basically do not support the rhythm of rest. And when you're in a situation where what you know from God's Word that is good for you, you are not doing, like me talking to myself on a glass bridge, so you are having a conversation with yourself. It's not that you're afraid of rest. It's not that you're afraid of what God wants for you. It's the fact that the rhythm of your body doesn't line up to the rhythm of God's Word, and you recognize that if you continue to do what you've always done in 2023, then the reality is that you are resisting what God has for you. And the only solution to that is for you to resist your resistance. Here's the problem with this. It is so instinctive for us to succumb to what comes naturally. When I walk out on that glass bridge, my body does its thing. My heart beats, my breath shortens, my mind goes. How hard is it for me to give in to that resistance? Not hard at all. I need to do absolutely nothing to give in to what my body is saying. And here's the reality. While it's instinctive to succumb to what comes naturally, it isn't always best. Some of us have got default operating procedures in the way that we respond to things that have been built up maybe through painful experiences, Maybe because it's the way that you were wired. Maybe it's the, the context in which you were born into, the family that you grew into. There are so many uh, variations to this, but each and every one of us have got default operating or response procedures, and it takes us no effort at all to give into this. It is so natural to give into what our body feels is natural. But the Bible says that's not always best. The Bible says that that's not always good. The Bible says that, hey, if you find yourself resisting something that God says is actually good for you, then the right response is to resist your resistance, not to give in to it. For my 40th birthday, Vipka thought it would be a really good idea to get me a skydive. She knows I don't like heights. She thought it would be a really good idea for me to skydive. And so she basically I opened the card, and in there was, you know, this, this thing. You're going to do a skydive with Solly, and uh, this is a gift for your 40th birthday. And, and Solly was uh, a man in our church in Tampa. And for 18 months, every weekend without fail, Solly would come to me and say, you ready for that jump? <laughs> oh, sorry, Solly, I'm really busy at this point. I'll try and get it in as soon as I can. 18 months. And eventually, I was kind of uh, the subject of an intervention, really, by Vipka and Solly. And they're like, you're going to do this thing. So we arranged to do it. I've shown some of you the video before. And I'm on the plane. And, and uh, I get, you know, so I'm strapped to Solly. And I, I get to the edge of the plane. And on the video, you can see me look down. And I throw my head straight back up. Because as soon as I saw the ground from 15,000 feet, my heart my breath, and my head was like, <gasps> now, Solly was with me. 
and I knew it was irrational. Now, some of you are thinking, Craig, okay, walking across a glass bridge, that's pretty irrational. But a skydive, okay, there's a greater risk to that. It's irrational. You know why it's irrational? Solly is a South African man who came to America on a Sporting One visa. A Sporting One visa is basically the type of visas that are restricted to top-level NBA, overseas NBA, NHL type players. Solly was the gold medalist at the World Skydiving Championship. Solly revolutionized skydiving in the way that Dick Fosbury revolutionized the high jump. You know, they used to, I'm not going to do that, I'll probably have a groin strain here. You know, they used to go over the high jump with a, with a little scissor kick, and then Fosbury came along, and he actually did that Fosbury flop. Solly revolutionized skydiving in the way that Fosbury revolutionized the high jump. How many of you have ever seen those mass skydiving jumps where hundreds and hundreds of people jump out of a plane? You ever seen those? It, chances are that Solly organized those and was right in the middle of them because he's done most of them. Solly trains national skydiving teams. Solly knew what he was doing. My fear was irrational because Solly was with me. But it didn't make it any easier. So I jumped out of the plane. That's Solly's sense of humor for you. <laughs> At this point, we've kind of not even, I think, reached terminal velocity. Okay, we're still going down, and it's like in the first few seconds of this, it is just terrible. Can I get on the edge of the plane? I sit, I lift my head up, and Solly goes, here we go. And I just close my eyes, and he's like, hey. And then, basically, we get to the point of terminal velocity, which basically means it doesn't feel like you're falling. And in this moment, I can start to talk to myself. Okay, Craig, you realize this is irrational, right? And then the fear goes. And in that moment, the joy is there. The joy. Basically, Scripture says that if we truly push past those things that our body kind of has to keep us weighed down, to drag us down, to keep us back. If we push through those things, we can experience the joy and the freedom that will ultimately have been worth all of the effort. The spiritual discipline of resistance. You see, resisting resistance is a pathway to freedom, and it is a critical discipline for deepening our experience of Christ. Let me ask you, what is holding you down? What is holding you back? What is dragging you down? What is weighing you down? The most natural thing in the world is for you to succumb to it, to give in to it, because it takes absolutely no effort at all to succumb to those things that you resist. But you deepen your experience of Christ, you deepen your relationships with other people, you find freedom when you resist those things that your body resists. And right now, you are either resisting or you are resisting your resistance. The Bible puts it like this in Romans chapter 12. Do not, the apostle Paul says, conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. You see, today you are either resisting God's will, or you are resisting the natural fleshly resistance to God's will. 
You are either conforming or you are being transformed. We're being formed one way or the other right now. Our relationship with God is dynamic. Our relationship with this world is dynamic. And your formation is either a con, which basically comes from the Latin prefix, which means to be swept along with. Your formation is either a con because you are being formed by being swept along with the natural resistance in the flesh to do God's will, or your formation is trans, which comes from the Latin prefix, which means to rise above. You're either rising above those things that weigh you down, that drag you down, that hold you back, or you are being swept along by the desires of your flesh and by the patterns of this world. What type of formation is true for you at this point? Is it a con? Is it all a lie? You think it helps you to walk away from that unforgiveness. But all it's done is dampen your energy, kill your joy, and destroy your relationships. You think it is actually helping you when you read God's Word, and God's Word says about the value of generosity, and your body resists being generous. You think that it is the best thing in the world to resist generosity because it's too hard, and there's the natural resistance, and you think it's the best thing in the world to ultimately hold on to your finances and not to be generous. In reality, it's all a con, it's all a lie. All it means is we're being swept away by the desires of the flesh and by the patterns of the world. What God says we need to do is we need to rise above. In Colossians 3, Paul puts it like this. Since then you have been, what? Raised with Christ. You understand the significance of being raised with Christ when you recognize the power of being weighed down, dragged down, and kept down. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Do you know the power of the gospel basically means that all of those things that tie you down, that weigh you down, that drag you down, don't have to keep you down. Do you know that's the power of the gospel? That's the power of the cross? That's the power of the resurrection? Why is that possible? Because your life is now hidden with God in Christ. You've been raised. What this basically means is that while my body does not like heights, I miss out on an awful lot, scripturally speaking, when I do not allow myself to be raised to the heights. You know, the Bible says that I would miss out on Jesus if I didn't rise to the heights because John 3:31 and 8:33 tell me that my Savior comes from above. I would miss out on my salvation because Psalm 18 and six, uh, verse 16 tells me that my salvation comes from above. I would miss out on new life because John 3 verse 3 tells me that new life, being born again, comes from above. I would miss out on wisdom because James 3.15 and James 3.17 tells me that wisdom comes from above. I would miss out on God's power because John 19 verse 11 tells me that this power of God doesn't come from below. It actually comes from above. The reality is for me in a very practical way. I resist my resistance to heights because God wants me to rise. And when I break free of that which holds me down, I experience the power of God in a profoundly new way. Friends, God wants you to rise in this life, not just in the next. He wants you to rise above what keeps you down, holds you down, and drags you down. He wants you to rise above it. In Isaiah chapter 40, the prophet Isaiah is being 
used by God to encourage a group of people who feel that the natural flow of things means that they will never get beyond their painful existence. In verses 7 and 8 of that chapter, we read of the frailty of human nature when the prophet writes, as grass withers and flowers fall, so do we. The human nature, the prophet says, is frail and vulnerable. But at the end of the chapter, God reminds the people that while falling is natural for the human race, rising is supernatural for those in in him. This is what we read at the end of this in Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Now remember the context. The, the context here is for people who feel that there is no hope, that what holds them down, keeps them down, brings them down, is always going to do that. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you've been battling a life-controlling hurt, habit, hang-up. Maybe there is something that you've never been able to shake, and you're thinking, can God? This word is for you. God says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. And this is the part we all love. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will, what? Soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. If you're here and you feel weighed down, bogged down, dragged down, that, and you feel that there is no hope for you to ascend, you reckon without the power of God who will strengthen those weak legs and will enable you to rise on wings like eagles. You see, God's power overcomes the downward pull of the flesh and even the downward pull of the world. Now, I love the metaphor here of the eagle's wings. See, when an eagle is attacked, what it does is the eagle ascends to new heights. The eagle overcomes its oppressors by flying higher and higher and higher. The eagle overcomes the attacks propelled not by its mighty wings on its own, but by the wind's currents. You may be here today and you may feel down. I want to tell you, God wants to lift you up. And the way that this works is not simply through your own strength. The faith that we have is, is a covenant. That basically means that we are to play our part and God plays his part. And as I was thinking about how do I illustrate this today, I, I was... Given the, the picture of a kite, now a kite rises according to the aerodynamic forces of lift and drag. A kite stays in the air because it manages to balance lift, drag, weight and thrust. It manages to balance them. And what I want you to know today is that God, God's plan for you, God's heart for you this year is for you to rise on heights to overcome those things that weigh you down. In order for you to rise like that, you're going to need to overcome those things that drag you down. In order for you to rise, you are going to need to avail yourselves of God's power that gives you the ability to propel you to even greater heights. If you are ever going to be free of those things that weigh you down, then the Bible says that you need to rise above them. And whenever we give in to those things that drag us down, they sap our energy, it kills our joy, it destroys our relationship, and it does us no good at all. 
doctors will point out that physical conditions happen in the human body when we allow those things that are not good for us to continue to plague us. When we allow our fears and our failures when we allow those hurts, those habits, those hang-ups to continue to press on us, and when we continue to repress them and push them away rather than deal with them, we end up paying a price that is far more costly than a walk over a glass bridge. But think about it like this. How many of us know if we do not pay our mortgage this month, the price we will eventually pay is far greater than the original amount we would have paid. If we don't make the payment on our mortgage this month, things get far worse for us in the long run. So with, with this is a, a picture. God wants us to, to rise above those things that weigh us down, that keep us down, that drag us down. What lessons do we learn from this kite that can help us make sure that we practice that spiritual discipline of resistance this year. What do we learn? Well, I think the obvious thing we learn is to welcome the headwind. That's just going to seem weird, but it's actually pretty simple. For a kite to harness the power of lift, it has to be perpendicular to the wind. For a kite to be impacted by the forces of drag, it is going to position itself parallel to the wind. In, in other words, Winston Churchill was right when he said, kites rise through the headwind, not against it. Kites rise because of headwind. If we are going to be successful in overcoming those things that weigh us down, that drag us down, that bring us down, then we have to position ourselves in such a way that the opposition lifts us up rather than drags us down. Kites rise against the wind, not with it. I mean, I wonder how many of us when it comes to those things that we battle for so long, think that this thing is being allowed because there's something wrong with us. Now, sometimes that's true. But it is always true that God allows opposition for us to experience freedom so that we can shake off what weighs us down, what brings us down, what keeps us down, and ultimately ascend to the heights. That is always true. Yet how many of us think that precisely because we are facing opposition, something is wrong? Maybe you're facing opposition because something is right. You are in Christ, and Christ has promised to make you more like Him through the work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're experiencing this headwind, not because there's something wrong, but because everything is right. More than that, maybe... Rather than telling yourself or praying, God, I just pray that this year would be so smooth, would be so flat, would be so good that I would experience no opposition. Maybe what we need to be saying is, Father, I recognize that Jesus made a promise. In this world, we will have trouble. We will have headwinds. So, Father, I pray that this year, 2023, would be a year where I would ascend to new heights in you. And so, Father, I pray that you would always position me perpendicular to the opposition that I face. <laughs> Rather than stand at it side on, help me face it head on. Because when I face the headwinds head on, I position myself perpendicular to the wind. And what happens then, the strength that you have given me through the Holy Spirit and your power will propel me to new heights. Welcome the headwind. Because kites rise because of it. It's disastrous. If any of you try to let a kite go on a windy day and you launch it, what, on a windy day? In the direction of the wind, but then you pull it. You pull it against the headwind. Why? Because against the wind, it climbs. 
Paul knew this. And this is Peter, rather. Peter knew this. I love this. Peter writes to, uh, in 1 Peter, to believers all across Asia Minor who were experiencing a lot of headwind. It was really difficult to be a follower of Jesus at that point. But I want you to know what he says. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to, what? To test you. As though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Stop there. Rejoice. How on earth do you rejoice when there's headwind? By recognizing that this headwind is going to take me higher and higher and higher. By recognizing that even though I am prone to thinking that suffering and power are ultimately two separate things, the reality is in Christ, suffering and power always go hand in hand. Many of us think when we are suffering that we have to wait for God's power. It's as if they are uh, basically follow one after the other. I suffer first, then God's power will come. No, if you understand this analogy of the kite, suffering and power are synchronous. They happen at the same time. Lift and drag. It is not possible to have one without the other. Faith and doubt. It is not possible to have one without the other. Suffering and power, when you're in Christ, both of them work together. How can we rejoice in the headwind? By recognizing that this wind is going to be used by God to take me higher. So we position ourselves to believe it. Look at what he continues. If you are, um, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Listen, if we want to rise above those things that drag us down, we need to welcome the headwind. We need to position ourselves to face this headwind Straight on, not walk away from it, not give in to it, not push it away, but ultimately stare it straight in the face. And then what we need to do is we need to surrender ourselves to the work of God. And when that happens, God will take us higher. Now, there's something else that happens as soon as we position ourselves in that way and we start to face this this thing that is holding us down, I believe that there is a, in that moment, uh, there is an internal battle. There is a wrestle that goes on. Just like it was with me when I'm in the plane looking down or when I'm on the bridge, immediately my body does what it does. My heart beats, my breath shortens, my mind races, and in this moment, I have a decision to make. The decision that we all face is to choose faith. Choose faith. How how many of you have ever taught your kids to to fly a kite? Have you ever done that? Have you ever done that? It's it's really interesting when you teach your kids to to kind of fly a kite. You kind of got it up here, right? And it's all pretty good. And sometimes the wind's swirling a little bit. And so the kite will be bobbing. And then what happens, though, is... The moment you try and give the the control to your kid, right, that's where this thing, that's where this thing suddenly starts to, to bob around, right? It's the exchange of control. The minute we decide to say, you know what, I am going to resist, those things that are resistant to God's will and God's word, we are signaling a commitment to exchange control. We are refusing to allow our body, okay? You see what happens too when it's not constructed properly, right? We are refusing to allow our feelings or our flesh to determine our future. We are making a decision to allow God and God's word to drive our future. And I'm telling you, the moment you do that is the minute where the wobble comes. It's like me walking on a glass bridge. It's like me sitting on the edge of that plane. And in that moment on the inside, your heart goes... 
your breath shortens, your mind races, and it's one of the most powerless feelings in the world. The minute you face that issue dead in the face and say, I no longer allow my fleshly resistance to drive my response to this, but I exercise my faith in God and I choose from this moment forward to live in God's way. Expect a wobble. It's natural because whenever you exchange control, there's the wobble. I love the way that Paul puts this. This scripture I'm going to put on the screen comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And what I want you to note is how Paul encourages the believers to choose faith even though. Even though their emotions are racing, their mind is racing, their heart is beating, everything seems to be wrong. Note that Paul doesn't say that this feeling isn't real. He doesn't say repress these feelings, push them down. He says stare them straight in the face and choose faith. We've heard an awful lot about faith over fear over the last couple of years. Some of that is justified. Some of it is completely uh, out of context. But I tell you, for every single person who wants to rise above those things that are holding them down, we are to face the wobble with faith. Because whenever we exchange control, there's a wobble. Have a look at this text. This is what Paul says. For while we are in this tent, this earthly body, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. You understand what he's saying here, right? For as long as we live in this body, in this world, facing this headwind, this opposition, there will be things coming against us that we would rather not have. And in that moment, we want to speed up this process, and we just want to get there. We just want it to be done. God just, you, you've got the power. How many of us pr pray this? God, you've got the power. Remove this thing from me. Paul prayed it. In this very book, Corinthians, he prayed it. <laughs> God, I've got this thorn in the flesh. Now, was it a person or was it a physical ailment? We don't know. But he said, God, I've got, I've got this, this problem. And you know that this problem is really debilitating and it's stopping me from fulfilling my vocation, my calling. So God, please, three times he prayed this prayer, three separate occasions over the period of his ministry. He said, God, I want you to take this thing from me and I know you can do it now. And he waits and he waits and nothing how many of you have had that experience? Nothing. And then God speaks to him, Paul, do you not realize that my grace is sufficient for you, but more importantly, what my power is made perfect in weakness? Paul, don't you realize that power and suffering actually are experienced hand in hand? Same time. Not one after the other, but the same time. So we want what is mortal to maybe swallowed up by life. We, do, we just want things to be new. And then Paul goes on. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. See, there's hope. Even in the wobble, even in the crisis, even when things are going chaotic, there is hope. Therefore, we are always confident... And know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by what? Faith, not by sight. Listen, if you want to overcome what's holding you down, pressing you down, tying you down, you've got to stare it straight in the face, acknowledge it for what it is, time to stop running away from it, repressing it, giving it the right to rule. But I tell you this, the minute you stare in the face and you choose Christ is the minute that the wobble comes. Because you are exchanging power from your flesh, from this world, into Christ. Expect the wobble. 
but realize what? You have been given the Spirit of God as a guarantee. In other words, God's got you. Just like Solly was strapped to me, I wasn't going to go down. God's got you. It may wobble. Some of your wobbles may be worse than others, but guess what? He's got you. Expect a wobble. And start to talk to yourself. Craig, this is completely irrational. Why are you giving this feeling so much control? Don't you realize that God's got you? And if God's got you, God's got this. So what do you do? You don't strive. Remember the sermon I gave on treading water? You don't strive. You don't struggle. What do you do? You just enter that surrender pose. And you just recognize that the best thing that you can do to stay afloat is nothing but depend on Jesus. So, welcome to Headwind. Choose faith. And lastly, this one is really important. Practice personal patience. Practice personal patience. As I've said, getting a kite airborne in a windy day isn't easy. It actually seems counterintuitive. You release the thing in the direction of the wind, and then you tug it. And as you tug it, you are patient as you get it up in the air. You practice patience. It takes both skill and patience to fly a kite on a windy day. But the secret is balance. For the kite to cruise, all the forces of torque acting on it have to be balanced. It takes skill, but it also takes patience. Remember what we said, it is second nature to, to succumb to what comes naturally. And, what, and because what comes naturally is often unhealthy, but it's all we've ever known, sometimes we may find ourselves succumbing, even though we've made a decision to choose faith and to follow God. We, may, we find ourselves succumbing to that which was once natural to us. Here's what's important. When that happens, show yourself the same kind of love and forgiveness as God shows you. I wonder how many of you have been dealing with issues for so long and you find yourself relapsing. You find yourself going back to that place that you never thought you'd ever go back to. If you've ever experienced that, what the enemy will do is heap shame and guilt on you and tell you that you will never, ever be free. But I want to tell you this. In that moment, you know what God wants you to do? God wants you to acknowledge what was wrong. And he wants you to experience his love and his forgiveness. And then he wants you to practice the same kind of compassion and love he shows you to yourself. He wants you to be patient with yourself. What I love about this verse on the screen, Romans 8.25 is that this is one of the verses that when it talks about patience, it actually is talking about you being patient with yourself. All too often when it's patience, we think about that extra grace required person, right? The annoying person. Thank the Lord the holiday season's done because they've gone home, that type of person. And we need to be patient with them. Often patience is something we show other people. Often kindness is something we show other people. Often compassion is something we show other people. But you know what? In order to show something biblically, you have to experience it personally. So Paul here says, but if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. We should have time to dig into the meaning of the words wait and patience. Patiently here talks about, pictures a soldier on a battlefield, surrounded. The situation looks desperate, but he is positive because he knows he'll win in the end. It's a positive term. Wait actually signifies desperation. Think about this. Urgent need with desperation. You put those two things together. That often is expressed in a kind of calamitous way where everything is going to go wrong. This verse says, look, when you're in a situation which is so desperate, you may find yourself so weak and helpless. You may find yourself reverting back to that standard operating procedure that you used to have in that moment. Be patient with yourself. Be kind to yourself. 
Now, I'm not asking you uh, to think of yourself more highly than you ought. All I'm asking you to do is to love yourself the way that God loves you. Love what God loves, loathe what God loathes. God never loathes you. And you have no right to put that shame on yourself either. The great thing with trying to overcome those things that have weighed us down is that we can experience God's patience and God's kindness and God's compassion and God's forgiveness over and over and over again. He said, if God shows you that kind of patience, won't you be willing to show yourself that patience? You can see the team are here. They're going to sing a song. This song focuses on Christ. And in my own life, uh, what I've noticed is that when God has revealed to me something that is holding me down, weighing me down, pulling me down, I often think about what I need. So maybe you're here today and, and you are angry because someone hurts you. You are bitter. Maybe you're harboring unforgiveness in your heart and you just think, God, uh, I need to forgive them. Maybe you're here today and uh, you just recognize you're not living a generous life. Greed is more a part of you than you want. You're thinking, God, uh, I need to be generous. Whatever it is, whenever we recognize that we need to deal with something, often we picture what goes along with it. And, and this is the point. If we substitute greed with generosity, anger with love, unforgiveness with forgiveness, all we are doing is thinking about the very thing that weighs us down. If you're here and you're battling with greed, and now the focus of your life is suddenly going to be on generosity. Every time you think of generosity, you know what's happening subconsciously? You're thinking about your greed. God, this is really important because I don't want to live like that. Do you know what the solution to this is? Do you know what the antidote to greed is? Do you know what the antidote to anger is? Do you know what the antidote to unforgiveness is? Do you know what the antidote to, uh, to hatred and bitterness is? Do you know what the antidote to impatience is? Jesus. Jesus. As we sing this song, whatever it is that God may have revealed to you that is holding you down, don't think of the opposite. Think of Jesus. Because you see, when you think of Jesus, you recognize that he who was rich became poor for your sake. When you think of Jesus and you think about that hatred and that unforgiveness you have in your heart, you look at Jesus, you look at the cross, and you just come face to face with a person who loves you and forgives you over and over again. Everything we need is Jesus. So as we sing this song, Christ be magnified, our prayer is that Christ would be magnified in you. Because when he is, resistance becomes so much easier. So listen, face the headwind. Choose faith. And show yourself the same kindness and compassion that God in Christ shows you. Look to Jesus and reach new heights. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I thank you for the cross, for Christ, for grace, and for love. Father, I thank you that we're in a time of year where we do look back and we try and look forward and, and we try and put into place those little things. And for some of us, they're big changes that we want to make to our life. And I thank you for a calendar that allows us to, to do that. Father, I pray that there would be a move of your spirit where we would resist those things in our lives that resist your will and your word. But Father, may we not do it in our own strength. May we do this by magnifying Christ above all things. We thank you that the solution to all we need is found in Christ 
and the cross in the power of the gospel. May we choose that message over and over again as we face our trials. In Jesus' name. Stand with us. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry? Then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified.
Church, thanks so much for worshiping with us this morning. You guys sounded amazing. As always, I pray that every song we sing may not just be another song, but that we're to our faith in Jesus and who we believe God is. Amen. Hey, on your way out, be sure to stop by the uh, tables out there to make sure that you look at the winter classes that we're offering. Go, co go connect with somebody. Go be part of a new community and see what God can do through those classes in your life and those around you. Be blessed. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next week.